take it away, Ken. All right. Excellent. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to tell you today about uh, our work on supernovae and the creation of hypervelocity stars. Uh, hopefully the previous three talks have whetted your appetite for some explosive revelations. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to start by talking about uh, supernovae and uh, if my thing would work. Okay, about supernovae. As Mike said, uh, there are two main classes of supernovae. So there are the core collapse supernovae, um, which refer to type 2 and type 1b and 1c. And these are the gravitational collapses of uh, stars that were initially at least 10 times more massive than the sun. Very interesting, but uh, I'm not going to actually discuss those. My focus uh, of my research is on type 1a supernovae. And um, spoiler alert, uh, we think that these are thermonuclear explosions of white dwarfs. Um, but for the next few slides, uh, we're going to pretend we don't even know what they are. We just see these supernovae. And so what does a supernova look like? Uh, what does a type 1a supernova look like? This is a well-studied example from 2011. This is supernova 2011 FE, uh, which happened in uh, a low uh, spiral galaxy. And we'll see over the course of a few months what happens. So here you see this pinpoint of light uh, get brighter in something like a, a month and then decay away over another few months. If you take the light of this supernova and make a plot uh, of its brightness versus time, it looks something like this. So the brightness is on the y-axis and the time in days is on the x-axis. And type 1a supernovae look like this. So these are a few different examples. Uh, they get brighter in something like 15 days and then decay away uh, in something like uh, 20 to 30 days. Now, you've almost certainly heard of type 1a supernovae for the role that they play in cosmology. And that's because they have this really uh, great feature where they're not standard candles, so they do have uh, quite a dispersion in how bright they get, but they're standardizable. And what that means is that the dimmer ones rise to their peak uh, more rapidly than the brighter ones. So you can use this fact to standardize them. You can say, you know, if I look at a type 1a supernova, I may not know how intrinsically bright it is yet, but if I, I, I do know how fast, uh, how rapidly it took, how, sh how long it took to rise to its peak. So then I do know it's intrinsic brightness uh, and can make a standard candle out of it. And that's great because in astronomy, as we all know, it's very hard to get distances to things, especially things that are outside of our own galaxy. And if we know the intrinsic luminosities of these supernovae, we can use how bright they appear to be and get a distance measurement to very, very far away galaxies this way. And type 1a supernovae are great. Not only are they standardizable, they also happen to be extremely bright. So we can see them uh, something like halfway across the universe. OK, so type 1a supernovae give us a cosmological distance indicator. OK, that's half, half the puzzle. Um, I don't need to tell you this. You're all physics teachers. But things that come toward us have a blue shift, and things that are moving away from us have a red shift. And so uh, galaxies, we've known since the 1920s that galaxies that are far away from us are also receding away from us. Okay, so we can uh, correlate the distance to a galaxy based on its type 1a supernovae. Uh, we can correlate that with the redshift of this galaxy, how, how rapidly it's receding away from us. We can make a plot of this, um, and it looks something like this. So this was done in the late 90s, and this plot shows the distance to a galaxy and the redshift of that galaxy. And the redshift you can just get by looking at the, uh, the spectrum of that host galaxy. The distance that requires something like a type 1a supernova, some distance indicator. And so it wasn't until the 90s where we had a large enough sample where we could actually make these measurements out to a high redshift. Say this is a redshift of one, which is roughly um, half the age of the universe. And what the people found was that, uh, very interestingly, type 1a supernovae were showing that the universe is not expanding in just a regular old um, sort of naive way. Instead, the things that are further away from us are actually receding away from us even faster uh, and the further you look, the faster these things are going in an accelerated way. So the expansion of the universe is accelerating. And you can see this by these uh, blue lines, these dashed lines, which are showing different cosmologies, different make uh, compositions of the universe. So this omega matter is how much matter there is in the universe, and omega lambda was this new thing, this cosmological constant. And you can see from these uh, data points that the best fit line was somewhere around here. Okay. And this has an omega lambda, this, uh, again, this component of cosmological um, dark energy or cosmological constant of around 0 0.7. Now, this was done in the late 90s. Um, 
you might, you know, squint at this and say, well, this is kind of being driven by these data points here. But I just look at this stuff, you know, it's not really statistically obvious that in the best fit line it can maybe be this one, which has no cosmological constants. Uh, don't worry, we're very careful. The other team, uh, we're very careful about this. But since then, in case that wasn't convincing enough, uh, many hours have been spent looking at distant type 1 supernovae, and there are a ton more points out here now. And so now it's quite uh, quite clear that this dark energy, this cosmological constant, makes up something like three quarters of the universe. Okay, so only a quarter is matter. Uh, only a very small percentage of that is actually regular matter. But uh, what type 1a supernovae were telling us is that three quarters of the universe is this dark energy, this acceler this this um, thing that causes the expansion of the universe to accelerate. Um, and so this led to the 2011 Nobel Prize uh, that was shared by these two teams that were using type 1a supernovae as these as these cosmological distance indicators. So this was really this really led to a revolution in how uh, we understand our universe. Uh, be prior to this, you know, some people were kind of considering it, but it wasn't until type 1a supernovae really uh, cemented it that um, we understood cosmological um, uh, accelerated expansion was a, was a real thing. Now, I'm not a cosmologist. Um, I think type 1a supernovae uh, are very useful, but I, I enjoy studying them for their own sake because I'm an astrophysicist. And so I, I, I'd like to know what type 1a supernovae are, what actually leads to them, and what this can tell us about stars. And so um, we can use the observation of type 1a supernovae not just broadly for their cosmological utility, but we can also uh, gain some insight into their progenitors from their observations. So again, this is the, uh, the light curves of type 1a supernovae. Very broadly, they rise to their peak in something like a few weeks and then decay away in a few weeks. And that immediately tells us something about the star that is exploding to cause them. Okay? And that's because photons, the light from the supernova, takes some time to get to us through the supernova. It has to go and get absorbed and re-emitted by all these uh, nuclei that are in the way, these atoms. And so it takes some time for them to random walk, to diffuse their way out of the supernova ejecta and eventually get to us. So that immediately tells us something about the amount of mass, the amount of material that's inside the supernova ejecta. Uh, if there were uh, really a lot of mass, it would take longer for these photons to get to us. And so the light curve would take longer to evolve. So the fact that it takes something like a few weeks to, uh, for a type 1a supernova to evolve tells us that the amount of mass is roughly equivalent to the mass in the sun, okay? uh, give or take you know, a few tenths of a solar mass. Right? So these are not 10 solar mass objects. These are not massive stars that are exploding. And they're not you know, 0.1 solar mass explosions. They're not just tiny parts of stars. Um, there's something that's roughly the mass of the sun. So that's the light curves. You know, if you just take a telescope and gather all the light from it, what happens when you take a spectrum, when you pass that light through uh, basically a, a fancy prism and, and refract the light into its constituent components? You get a spectrum, uh, which other, other people discussed already um, and you're probably familiar with. This is a solar spectrum, which shows lots of these absorption lines. Uh, and as we all know, these absorption lines tell us the chemical composition of what's inside. Um, and so, for example, if you have a hydrogen atom uh, in a particular excited state, so this one has uh, an electron in its first excited state, it's only going to be able to absorb very specific wavelengths of light um, to change the energy state of that electron. So in this particular example, the red light doesn't uh, get absorbed by the hydrogen, the blue light doesn't either. It's this particular, uh, it should actually be a cyan kind of frequency, um, to change this electron from the first excited state up to the third. So for the aficionados, that's speech beta. And so that leads to a spectrum where the red light gets through, the red light gets through, the blue light gets through, but the green light gets absorbed. So what, it, what happens when you take a type 1a uh, supernova spectrum? Uh, what does that tell us about the chemical composition? So you get these kinds of uh, signatures. So there's a bunch of different type 1a supernova uh, spectra, and they all share a few hallmark uh, features. So one of these features that's very obvious is this silicon line absorption line around um, roughly 6,000 angstroms. And it tells you that there is silicon in the, in the supernova ejecta. Okay. You also see this broad line here. This is calcium. Okay, so there's calcium around. Um, this uh, a funny looking W thing is a sulfur doublet. So there's sulfur in the explosion. And there's a bunch of these iron lines. So iron has a lot of transitions, so it gives you a lot of lines. Okay, so whatever is exploded has produced silicon and sulfur and calcium and iron. And uh, there's some oxygen around. It's also, these, these spectra are also very interesting for what they don't show. 
Okay, in particular, there's no hydrogen. There, hydrogen, there should be hydrogen line here and somewhere in here. There's no hydrogen. There's also no helium. Okay, and these are very interesting because hydrogen and helium, as we all know, make up the vast majority of the stuff in the universe. So um, if the 98% of the matter in the universe should be hydrogen or helium, and yet there's nothing in this spectrum. Okay, so that's a really important clue to what has exploded. It can't just be a main sequence star, uh, very obviously, because those have a lot of hydrogen and helium around. So it has to be some evolved star okay, uh, that has gotten rid of its hydrogen and helium. Now, for these and other, well, a lot of other reasons, we're pretty sure that the thing that has exploded uh, was initially made of carbon and oxygen. Because when you take carbon and oxygen and you uh, blow it up, you, uh, when it undergoes runaway thermonuclear fusion, it produces a mix of silicon and sulfur and iron and nickel and calcium and the things that we see in the spectrum. And uh, if you don't start with hydrogen and helium, you don't get hydrogen and helium uh, in, in the spectrum. So for these and other reasons, we're pretty sure that what leads to type 1 supernovae are the explosions of carbon, oxygen, and white dwarfs. Okay. So that's great. Um, very interesting. The, in the previous three talks, we've heard about white dwarfs, but we have not seen them explode, right? Um, and that's just because white dwarfs on their own, we expect to be very, very stable. Right? If the sun is going to become a white dwarf, we do not expect it to explode. It'll just uh, uh, be held up by electron degeneracy pressure. It'll cool off, it'll eventually uh, freeze, it'll crystallize, and then it'll just keep cooling off for the age of the universe, right? So white dwarfs on their own just don't explode. What we, what almost all when a uh, type when a supernova researchers think is that the white dwarf has to be in a binary system. It has to have some sort of companion that triggers an explosion. Okay. There are a few different uh, progenitor scenarios for these binaries that might lead to a type when a supernova. The one that I've focused most of my energy on involves um, binaries where the other companion star is another white dwarf. So there are other kinds of scenarios that people um, study and might be the progenitor for 1As, but I have, uh, for various reasons, have invested most of my time in double white dwarf binaries. Now, double white dwarfs can be born so far apart that they never interact, that they'll effectively, for the lifetime of the universe, just be two white dwarfs spiraling around each other, but not do anything, okay? But there is a subset of double white dwarfs that are born close enough that, that they will undergo an interaction. And the reason this is this happens is because they're spiraling around um, close enough that, they, that the orbit emits gravitational waves. They're, um, they're bending the, the, you know, the fabric of space-time in such a way that their orbit uh, releases gravitational waves, and these take away angular momentum and energy and cause the orbit to decay until eventually the white dwarfs get close enough to interact. Now, you've, I'm sure, heard of binary black holes and, bin and the binary neutron star uh, being detected by LIGO. And so this is um, a very, very, and now it's you know, exactly the same process. It's just two white dwarfs, not two black holes or two neutron stars. Because of the uh, characteristics of this orbit, they're much further apart when they interact than binary black holes and binary neutron stars are. So as a result, they're not going to be detected. They haven't been detected by LIGO. They won't be detected by LIGO. However, um, in hopefully the uh, 2030s, there will be a space-based mission that's akin to LIGO called LISA. So this is the uh, Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, okay, LISA, uh, that will be launched that will function much like LIGO, but uh, on a vastly different scale. So LIGO has arms that are something like a few kilometers long. LISA will have... Uh, these, way, uh, these, uh, uh, these arms will be something like a few million kilometers long. So it'll pro probe a very different uh, regime of gravitational waves that is suited to search for different things. And in particular, will be really, really good at looking at finding double white dwarf systems. Okay. So we'll be able to see these uh, decaying double white dwarfs as they get closer and closer together and eventually interact. So what happens when double white dwarfs uh, interact? Um, there are very, a few different uh, things that can happen, but the one that I'm most interested in is what is the possibility that they will explode. So this simulation will show is two white dwarfs that are undergoing an interaction and eventually explode. Uh, on the left panel, we'll see density, so this is where the mass is. In the right panel, we will see temperature, um, and the brighter points will be the hotter, the hotter regions. And these are top-down views um, of these two white dwarfs. 
Now, as Mike mentioned, uh, white dwarfs are backwards in the sense that the more massive one is smaller in a radial extent. So this smaller thing is the more massive white dwarf. This larger one is the less massive white dwarf. And they're close enough together where the gravity of this more massive white dwarf is pulling material off of, um, off of the less massive white dwarf. There it goes. Uh, sorry, you, all your nice faces are in the way. Okay. <laughs> Uh, okay, good. So you see the less massive white dwarf is donating material onto the surface of the more massive white dwarf. And where it impacts the surface leads to a hot spot. Okay, it's just this material is uh, converting its kinetic energy into thermal energy, and so it gets hot there. Keep going. See the onset of an explosion. Right. And so it's only happening in the surface layers. Now, um, as Mike mentioned, uh, in particular, these white dwarfs are carbon oxygen uh, through and through in the core, but the surfaces should have some helium. So there's helium on the surface here, and there's helium on the surface of this donor. So it's donating helium that is interacting with this helium. And it leads to an explosion, uh, what's known as a detonation, in the helium surface layers on top of this white dwarf that will propagate around the surface. And as it propagates around the surface, oops, I pressed the wrong button. That's too bad. Uh, as it propagates around the surface, it sends a shock wave into the core that ignites the core. So that happens there, right? So there was a surface detonation and it triggered a carbon detonation in the core. So these are, I wish I could aim the mouse. These are known as double detonation scenarios because of the surface detonation that triggers a core detonation. Great. So this next simulation will be a zoom in of that um, process so we can see a little better what's happening. This is a cutaway through, um, through the white dwarf that's going to explode. So this is the North Pole, this is the equator, this is the South Pole, and this is the center of the white dwarf. Um, just to make sure, you can see my cursor, right? Uh, a nod, anything? Yes, no? Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, Sorry, the faces are looking at were frozen and I was worried that the internet had cut out and I'd been talking to no one for 30 minutes. Um, so we'll see the, uh, the shell ignition happen up here and it's gonna spread down to the equator and eventually the South Pole. And as it spreads, it'll send a shock wave into the core. The colors are the temperature. So redder is bluer, uh, sorry, redder is hotter. Um, and these white lines are isodensity contours. So they're lines of constant density. Initially, the white dwarf is spherical. Um, so all the lines are, are circles or half circles, um, but we'll see a shock wave that will change that. Right, so here goes the helium shell detonation. So it's happening along the surface of the white dwarf, spreading down from the North Pole to the equator. So right now it has covered the Northern Hemisphere. You can see as it's going in, it's sending the shock wave into the core. And that's changing, it's perturbing the isodensity contours, which you can see um, as these changes to the circular aspect. Right. And eventually, the helium shell detonation will reach the southern hemisphere. Okay, and so the helium shell detonation is finished, but the shock wave is not finished. Uh, the shock wave from the northern hemisphere is only propagated to about here, and the southern hemisphere shock wave is now coming up to meet it. And as this shock wave converges on itself, it's putting a lot of energy into a smaller and smaller volume, until eventually a temperature and density high enough to ignite that second detonation, right? So there it goes. So that helium shell detonation is putting all this energy into this little small volume, and that's what triggers the secondary um, carbon core detonation. So again, a double detonation scenario uh, in a system with two white dwarfs. Now this is a little bit convoluted. I mean, it's two detonations, not just one. Um, and you know, you have to it's interesting geometry that's required. But it's actually not that crazy of an idea. Uh, and it's something that has happened on Earth. Um, a very obvious analogy is, uh, if you know anything about thermonuclear weapons, um, this is uh, akin to how one of the parts of a hydrogen bomb works. I'm certainly no expert in that, but there is some key aspect, a key, key stage where a bunch of energy is being focused into a small region to ignite um, a fission fusion reaction. Um, however, to me, that's not the most interesting analogy on Earth. There's a somewhat more stretched analogy, but one that I think is so interesting that I always talk about it. So this involves what's known as a snapping shrimp. There's only uh, like an, uh, a couple centimeters across. So it's a pretty small shrimp, 
But if you've heard a ra radio lab episode um, about snapping shrimp, you'll know that they're actually one of the main sources of noise in the ocean. And that's due to this giant claw, okay? Um, so there's one regular claw, but then this giant claw on the, on the shrimp. Actually, uh, you might think that that claw is used for combat, that it's, you know, powering this giant thing that will uh, attack its prey and its, and its competitors with, but it's actually not. The claw is actually pretty small. Um, it's, it's over here uh, in, in um, silhouette. All this uh, claw is a giant piece of muscle to make this part close really fast. And when it closes, uh, it has this really interesting shape where there's this protuberance on one side and a hole on the other side. And when it closes, uh, it closes really fast and it squirts out a jet of water moving so fast that it hits its prey uh, and it stuns it. But it's moving so fast that it actually capitates. So we'll see this in this movie. Right, there goes the jet, but um, that jet is moving so fast it turns into vapor, right? It, the pressure in that stream drops below the vapor pressure of water, the water surrounding it, and it turns from liquid into gas. So that's the process known as cavitation, uh, which you know ships are always trying to avoid because it's damaging to the propellers. But in this particular case, um, the shrimp is using it, using this jet to send its prey. It develops this vapor bubble, but because it's a bubble underwater, um, the pressure of the water surrounding it collapses it, right? And it collapses it, boom. Um, however, it's, the, the water is doing all this work and it's concentrating into a very small volume. And it's actually uh, so much energy in such a small volume that it raises the temperature high enough to emit light. So this is a process known as sonoluminescence. Uh, it also generates a shock wave that um, is the source of the snap that, that submarines and you know, sonar are hearing. Um, so it's a really, I think, interesting case where nature has figured out a way to uh, turn water into vapor under, you know, deep at the bottom of the ocean uh, and concentrate so much energy into a small volume that it generates light from this, which I think is just amazing. I highly listen, I recommend listening to that Radio Lab uh, episode if you can find it. All right, so back to white dwarfs. This is, you know, sort of analogous to what's happening in this white dwarf. This uh, helium detonation is sending in a whole bunch of energy into a small volume, and it's triggering this secondary detonation. Now, we're, we've done a lot of work recently um, trying to figure out what this kind of explosion would look like, and indeed, we think it looks like a Type 1A supernova. The more and more work we do on it, the closer, you know, the better, uh, the better able it's able, the better it is able to uh, look like a Type 1A supernova. So the more work we do on it, the more convinced, I, at least I am, that this is the mechanism that, that um, leads to type 1A supernovae. So that's one aspect of the research I've been working on. Um, another uh, aspect that I think is really interesting is what happens to this other star? Okay, so in this particular simulation, as you can see, the star is still here, right? This, this donor star is still here when the explosion happens. It's not anywhere near um, being blown up itself or being disrupted. The explosion from this uh, star is not is not able, it's not energetic enough to unbind the star. So the star could survive. If it were to survive, what would it look like? Um, this would be like a smoking gun that this explosion happened because there's no other way to, um, you know, this will be a very unique star. And it's unique because of its proximity to this supernova explosion, right? So this supernova explosion converted all this carbon and oxygen into the things we saw inside the spectrum. We just saw silicon and sulfur and calcium and iron. All that material is going to be spread across the surface of the star um, in a very unique way that will be very different from all other stars that we see. Right? It'll you know, create this unique fingerprints when we see all the silicon and sulfur and et cetera on the surface of the star. No other stars are like this. Right? And so this would be a very unique thing. If we could see, uh, if we could take a spectrum of such stars, it'd be a very uh, nice way to fingerprint them. When I give public talks, um, I like to use this analogy. The surviving star is something like this cake pop, right? This, the cake is the regular white dwarf, but on top of it, you have these sprinkles, this thermonuclear ash that is um, it's a very obvious way to identify them. The question is, how do we know which stars to look at? You know, how do we know, know which stars to take a spectrum of and, and look for this thermonuclear ash? It's not like we can, at least yet, it's not like we can um, go into you know, look at every single star in the galaxy and, and look for these, um, these fingerprints. However, this scenario has another, another very nice feature, which is uh, its speed. Okay, so remember this was a double white dwarf system. This was in a relatively tight orbit. Um, 
white dwarfs, again, are roughly the size of the Earth, but they have the mass of something like the sun. So you can imagine that they're uh, moving quite rapidly, something uh, like thousands of kilometers a second um, as they orbit each other. So when one, the accretor, uh, the more massive star explodes, as a type 1a supernova, what happens to the other star? Well, the gravitational potential that was holding this binary together is no longer there, right? So when one star disappears, the other star will be flung out uh, very much like a slingshot, okay? So when David lets go of his slingshot, this rock will be uh, let loose at the speed it was traveling at in a straight line. And for the case of these double white dwarf binaries, that surviving white dwarf will be moving up to 2,500 kilometers a second, okay? So it's only 1% the speed of light. The whole star has been accelerated to 1% uh, the speed of light, which is pretty remarkable. Uh, you can get from Berkeley, you know, across the U U.S. in under two seconds. You can get to the moon in two and a half minutes. Very importantly, on the cosmological scale, you can actually, uh, the star will be ejected from the Milky Way. So these speeds are high enough where they are above the escape speed of um, whole galaxies. And for the case of the Milky Way, it would leave the Milky Way's influence in something like a few million years, okay, which is sort of a long time, but you know, on a galactic or on a cosmological scale, scale it's actually pretty short. It's actually um, fast enough to reach our nearest large neighbor in under a giga year. So just a few hundred million years, um, these hypervelocity stars could reach another galaxy. All right, so we, this is the way to look for them, right? They're moving much, much faster than regular stars. Regular stars uh, you know, are usually tens of kilometers a second, maybe up to 100 kilometers a second. 2,500 kilometers a second is you know, just unheard of. So if we could figure out a way to uh, um, get the actual velocities of stars, Provide, this mechanism would provide a very unique way, a very easy way to identify which stars to take spectra of and look for those thermonuclear ash signatures. So this is indeed what we were able to do um, a few years ago, uh, thanks to the help of Gaia, which has been mentioned before, this uh, unique satellite that gave us distances to stars and thus was able to give us absolute velocities of stars. And so this was a relatively easy exercise, just find the fastest stars that we could using Gaia and then take spectra of them. So um, uh, I and a whole bunch of colleagues were able to do this. And we found three stars that were indeed moving really, really fast. So they you know, were the fastest by far in the Gaia data and the fastest stars uh, that are unbound from the galaxy. And then we took spectra, and indeed we found what we'd hoped to see, which was that they are covered in thermonuclear ash. and had very strong signatures of silicon and calcium and iron and magnesium and all the things we hope to see um, if they were right next to a supernova explosion. And even better, one actually pointed back to the remnant of a supernova. So after supernova explode, their material hangs around for a while. We can still see it. And if we trace the position, uh, if we trace the trajectory of one of these stars back, it actually pointed right to a supernova remnant. So that was really uh, even more confirmation that these stars uh, happened because of supernovae. So that was great. Um, that definitely made us happy. But we're still pursuing a few big questions. So one of them is, uh, do all type 1a supernova happen this way? I mentioned there are other progenitor scenarios uh, that definitely could be taking place. Um, we know that, at least for these three stars, they happen this particular way with double white dwarfs. Um, we'd like to know if all type 1a supernova happen this way, if we can say that this is the main or maybe the only progenitor scenario that leads to type 1a supernovae. And um, as we're doing this work, we're um, you know, modeling the explosions and, and seeing what they would actually look like. As we do this, we can uh, figure out if there are you know, very, very subtle things that are happening. Say the light curve is very subtly different or the spectra uh, look a certain way. Um, are there things that might happen as the populations, as, as these galaxies are aging in cosmological time that change the way type 1a supernovae look? Um, so that's important because to do this cosmology, to um, do these inferences of the makeup of the universe, it relies on knowing the, the properties of the supernova are very, very uh, far away, and very far away means at a young age. And so it's the different population of stars that are exploding than the ones in the present day. Now it's a zeroth order. Uh, it's just the white dwarf, we think it's just a white dwarf exploding, but if there are very subtle things that are changing the light curves, that'll change subtly the cosmological uh, inferences we have. And so if we're trying to get you know, the value of the cosmological constant to many uh, decimal points, these kind of effects might be important. Um, and uh, with that, I will stop because I'm right at time. But um, yeah, this is, I, I think, one of the 
uh, very interesting applications of um, Hoytorf astrophysics, and I'm happy to take questions. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Dan. All right. We have plenty of time for entering a discussion before the breakout sessions at noon. Okay, so there is Vince. Yeah, I was wondering uh, how the detonation scenario might be different if the donor star was not a white dwarf, but a red giant or something like that. Yeah, so this is a whole class of progenitor scenarios I did not discuss at all. Um, and it's actually the one that um, was sort of the standard for many, many years, um, and is probably still the standard in most textbooks. Um, and again, I'm sorry, I didn't have any time to talk about it, but that's like an entirely different explosion mechanism where the idea is to make the white dwarf in that system um, accrete, you know, gain enough mass to grow up close to the change of safeguard mass, this limit that um, has been mentioned uh, this morning. At that limit, um, which is roughly 1.4 solar masses, as you approach that limit, the white dwarf is growing uh, smaller in size, and so its density is getting higher and higher. And eventually the density gets high enough that carbon nuclei at the center can just start interacting, they start fusing, right? So as you approach the change of sacred mass, you ignite, uh, not you, the white dwarf ignites carbon fusion in the center. That eventually, through a whole chain of events, uh, leads to uh, an explosion. So it leads to a deflagration, which is subsonic, slower than the speed of sound. And that deflagration is then, uh, then possibly transitions to a detonation, a supersonic flame. So eventually you get to that detonation. It's just a very different way of doing it. Okay, next we have Sean. Oh, absolutely, thank you. That's exciting. Um, totally different, like you said. It's in our textbooks that we learned that uh, red giants are the donors and they're the reasons for the ignition. But uh, now you're telling us that probably it's much more likely to be a white dwarf, white dwarf pair. And uh, that's so just really to be exciting. clear, um, just to be clear, that's my thoughts. Um, okay. There are definitely people that uh, think it's not double white dwarf binaries. Um, I would say that very few, I don't want to put numbers on it, but most people don't think it's red giants anymore uh, because there are other issues with red giants having to do with what happens when the supernova, um, when the exploding white dwarf interacts with the red giant on its way out, uh, that leads to visible things. So most people I think would say it's not red giants, but there are people that think it, it could still be main sequence stars or slightly evolved main sequence stars. So is it possible that the white dwarfs actually make contact with each other or is the tidal forces are just too strong? They're going to be ripped apart? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so there is an, uh, let's see, uh, let me say two things. One is that um, in the simulations I was showing, the the more massive white dwarf is, uh, it's a zeroth order. It's not really Im uh, impacted at all. It's not affected at all. I mean, obviously it's affected materials coming down upon it, but um, the bulk of the material is still basically a sphere. The less mass of the white dwarf is being tidally disrupted, but it happens over many, many orbital periods. So it's, you know, mass is being pulled off it first uh, in a relatively gradual way. And it's only when um, this goes on for a long time that it eventually would get tidally disrupted if the explosion didn't happen first. So um, it's on its way to tidal disruption. The explosion might happen before then. Okay, so that's one part. The other part is, yes, there is a class of scenarios where um, they're actually, they don't interact tidally before they collide. So instead of being in an orbit, maybe you have a system where they actually end up colliding head on. Um, that's a different scenario. That's not the one I'm talking about. But yes, that is also a progenitor scenario. <laughs> there are lots of progenitor scenarios. Great. Um, Cliff. Okay, thank you for a wonderful talk. I really appreciated it and enjoyed it. And my question is, um, assuming we have this wonderful explosion, what kind of force and or energy are we releasing? And is there any potential, and pardon me being a little sci-fi, but any potential for using that energy to human benefit? 
Uh, I can answer the second one first. Um, uh, we would want to not any, be, be anywhere near this thing. Right? It's, it releases so much energy that it's um, uh, in a conceivable human civilization time scale. I don't think we're ever going to get close enough to tap into the actual kinetic energy of this explosion. So releases um, of order 10 to the 51 ergs, um, which is 10 to the uh, 44 joules, is that right? 10 to the 7, 10 to the 7 ergs in a joule. I forget exactly. But anyway, it's a tremendous amount of energy. Um, and if we were anywhere near it, I think we would definitely be in trouble. <laughs> Yeah, it's like you. Whatever you do when you collect energy, you want to be in a position where you can't regulate the amount of energy that you're uh, you're capturing. This is likely not the case. Um, Erminio next. Oh, thank you, Dr. Shen. Uh, a, a possible scenario then: what would could something possibly happen between Sirius and its white dwarf companion and if so, we're only 8.6 light years away from that. Um, let's see. So I don't remember the exact uh, orbital parameters of that system. I don't know if it will form a double white dwarf system that's close enough to interact on a useful time scale. Um, so I can't answer the specifics. Um, if it were to eventually happen, um, it would happen again on you know, uh, cosmological time scales because uh, the main star in Sirius or the, the bright star in Sirius is still uh, a main sequence star. And so, um, you know, it's not going to evolve for another uh, roughly two solar masses, right? So it'll take of order a couple of giga years before it does, you know, it starts to become a, a white dwarf. Um, but yeah, I don't actually remember if what kind of system that system will become. Um, it will become a double white dwarf system because uh, Sirius A is, um, is it A? Anyway, the main sequence star in Sirius is, I mean, yes. uh, is low enough mass to become a white dwarf. So it will become a double white dwarf system. I just don't remember if um, it will be close enough to, to interact on a cosmological time scale. And so so JJ, JJ suggested the orbit is about 50 years, the orbital period. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, let's see. So when... This is embarrassing. I'm sure someone else can help me out. Um, when, when the main sequence star evolves, it expands. Um, and so I'm pretty sure it will interact with uh, its white dwarf as it expands and becomes a red giant. I don't remember reading the actual evolution then, because interesting things happen when the white dwarf will interact with that uh, expanding star. Um, things like what's known as a common envelope, where um, a lot of the expanding star gets ejected out of the system and you end up with a much closer orbit um, than you started with. So I don't remember if that is what's going to happen or if it will end up merging before Sirius A forms a white dwarf. Um, yeah, maybe someone else can help me. Help. Someone help. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can look that up also. I'm sure a paper has been written about this and um, get back to you. I mean, we were talking earlier about we don't really know the fate of the Earth in the Earth-Sun system because tides from the sun are going to be competing with orbital expansion. And here, it's a similar situation. Tides from uh, the white dwarf will be interacting with the drag from the eventual red giant of Sirius A. And so anybody that tells you the future of that system is probably lying to you because it's hard to simulate. <laughs> so... Uh, it's, it's unclear how close they'll get together eventually, but um, they will definitely get closer together. Uh, but the question is how much closer. Erminia, does that answer your question, or at least partially? Yes, I, I'm sorry I put uh, Dr. Shen on the spot. Is, no, is eight would 8.6 light years be too close? Would be dangerous? Uh Another good question. I, I, I think so. I think that's not great for our atmosphere. Um, yeah. But I'm not positive because, yeah, definitely a, a gamma ray burst I think would be bad. Um, oh, yeah. I'm not sure if there's enough energy in the radiation of 1A at that distance. 
another thing to look up and get back Sorry to. Sorry again. We're fallible. We, we don't know everything, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I know the distance of which we are safe from a GRP, which is about 500 light years. Uh, I guess if you can convert that, if you know the angle, uh, cone angle. I, I would say that probably it's a little too close for comfort, yes. I wouldn't want that. It'd be map. very uh, exciting to see, that's for sure. It'd be very bright. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Nicole. Hello. Um, I have two questions. One is about um, the in your model. Then, are we are there different possibilities for the mass of the white dwarf white dwarfs that are exploding? In which case, there would be possibly different brightnesses. If I understood what you were saying. And then the second question is something I read about crystallization of uranium during cooling as a possible way for the white dwarfs to explode. It's just a paper by Horowitz and Kaplan. And I'm wondering where the uranium would come from in the white dwarf core and how could there be enough of it to cause that? Okay, wow, these are very um, detailed questions. Uh, so for the first question, yes, the answer is yes. Um, we do expect different masses for the white dwarf center to go explosion. Uh, in the other progenitor scenario that had to do with the change of sacred mass that, you know, was a certain mass, um, a mass limit, and so all the white dwarfs are exploding at roughly the same mass. But in this progenitor scenario, as you uh, adeptly noted, there's no reason that the mass would matter, right? Um, I mean, there are some reasons that the mass would matter, but there should indeed be a range of masses. And so we expect um, something like roughly 90% of the mass of the sun up to uh, something like 110% of the mass of the sun to explode and produce the range of luminosities that we see in type 1a supernovae. Uh, as I said before, they're not standard candles, they're standardizable, and that's because there is a pretty large range. Um, there's something like a factor of 10 in luminosities at peak for these supernovae, and so we think that's because um, of the different masses of the explosions. The second question, um, that's a very recent paper, um, uh, and so um, I think people in the community are still digesting the answer or the, the outcomes. The basic idea was um, that for reasons of molecular dynamics that I don't fully understand because it's way outside my purview, um, uranium um, nuclei at the center of the white dwarf could start getting together and preferentially uh, find each other and form uranium crystals. So uh, like what Mike was talking about, crystallization, you know, this freezing of the whole carbon oxygen white dwarf, um, this could take place for just the uranium part of it. Um, and they would form these little crystals and eventually possibly um, form supercritical masses. Uh, uranium is radioactive, it's fissionable. And so as it decays, it releases neutrons. Once you get enough of this uranium together, the neutrons can start um, uh, causing a chain reaction, right? They find another uranium that causes it to release, it's actually several neutrons. And so they, you know, uh, cause this chain reaction and release a bunch of energy, which then in this paper um, was suggested that could uh, then ignite a little uh, sort of spark that would ignite the white dwarf and cause it to explode. Um, the question of how much uranium um, is a tremendously small amount. So just throughout the universe, there is uranium that's been produced um, in other kinds of explosions. And so it just pollutes the universe and it has a fairly long half-life. So there's still a lot of it around, you know, not all of it is decayed. And so when the white dwarf forms as a star and it goes through all its stages of evolution, eventually becomes a white dwarf, the uranium is there. Um, again, a very, very trace amount, but there is still uranium. And so the idea was that this uranium could then find each other and form these little uranium crystals and then explode. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Natasha. Hi, uh, thank you, Ken. That was super interesting. I'm just wondering what your uh, next steps are. Like, what uh, what instrument are you hoping to use? What what are you looking for next to try and um, really make this this idea um, more more real? Um, 
I think the idea is real as it is. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, so there are a few different things that um, me, uh, my colleagues and I are, are looking at. One is sort of theoretical, um, as I mentioned, looking at the explosion models and seeing what they look like and seeing all the various details and seeing if they look like type 1a supernovae. But I think what you're referring to is um, finding more of these hypervelocity stars. So um, we did our best, I think, that we can do with Gaia. Um, Gaia was amazing uh, and so, so revolutionary in many fields. But one thing that um, would have been nice uh, in some fantastical world where we didn't have to care about trade-offs is if it could have gone deeper um, in the sense that it could have seen fainter stars. Um, so, you know, the stars that we discovered are sort of near the limit where Gaia can see. Uh, they're almost faint enough that Gaia wouldn't have detected them. And I would have liked to see more than three because um, if indeed type 1a supernovae all come from this mechanism and they always leave a survivor, then we should have seen many more, not just three, but something like a hundred or a couple hundred. Uh, what I'm thinking or I'm hoping is that the other stars are too faint to see. Um, we found the three brightest ones, but the rest are too faint to see with Gaia. And so um, I've been trying to think of ways to look for these hypervelocity stars using other instruments that go much fainter, but one of the problems, I mean, one of the, you know, Gaia is amazing because it gave you absolute distances to stars, and with absolute distances, that gives you an absolute velocity. If you don't have that, um, all you can say is that the star is moving fast across the sky, but I don't know uh, how far away is it, it is, and so I don't know in an absolute sense how fast it's moving. So then you have to think of other ways to get at the distances to these stars, um, which are more difficult, but I think will be necessary if we want to find more than just these three. So that's the main thing is um, using optical telescopes on the ground and trying to figure out how to get distances to the stars that way. So just to add on to that, um, you, know, you don't have to explain fully, but so we could technically then see stars that were ejected from the Andromeda traveling through our galaxy, yeah? Um, yeah, um, possibly. So, you know, I, I gave Andromeda as, as an example, just because I think it's interesting that you could actually send stars to other galaxies. Um, for us, looking at Andromeda and Andromeda looking at us, the amount of the sky that the galaxy covers um, is quite small. And so, uh, you know, the stars are going off all over the place. The, the chance that one of them will be pointed right at us from Andromeda is actually pretty small. That said, um, there is evidence for at least one or two stars uh, that we think actually came from uh, one of the nearby dwarf galaxies, the Large Magellanic Cloud, not due to this mechanism, due to some other mechanism. Um, but there is evidence for stars coming from another intact galaxy due to uh, hypervelocity ejection. So it is definitely possible. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Uh, Sean, last question, and then we'll move to the breakout rooms. Yeah, I was just going to say, it would be really awesome if LIGO was able to detect these mergers. Um, I, I imagine that, that looking forward to that, that would be a really great confirmation of what you're saying, is that, that you know, you could, you could get the gravitational waves, estimate the distance that way, and then also show with your models that, uh, you know, that the, the type 1A supernova is not necessarily that, that 1.4 solar mass phenomena that would be really quite remarkable i i'm not i just wanted to make a comment i just i'm excited for you i think the future is bright <laughs> yeah um I, I think so too so to be clear uh, ligo won't be able to detect these it'll have to be uh, the space-based one lisa and uh even though lisa will be able to detect a whole bunch of double white dwarf binaries um they're all inside the galaxy just because um, at these separations, the amount of gravitational wave emission is actually relatively small compared to the things that LIGO is able to see. So as a result, we don't, we won't be able to see these in other galaxies, or at least not far away galaxies. And so, um, since we're confined to our own galaxy, the chance that a 1A will happen is actually relatively small on a human time scale, um, maybe every couple hundred years. So there is a chance that one goes off and, um, in the time that Lisa is up, uh, you know, actually functioning in the sky, but uh, that would be amazing. I agree with that. Um, I think the chances are pretty slim, though. All right. Thanks again, Ken.
And thanks again to all the speakers. Um,